everyone to enjoy. So a bit about me, even though Hannah's already given you quite enough. I'm Associate Editor of Humanities at CMAJ, a fiction author and a freelance journalist. Um, won a couple of awards, stuff like that. So. Um, here's a brief bi bibliography. Um, the only thing really of note here for you is that um, I've over the years edited hundreds and hundreds of narratives um, through my work at the CMAJ. So, um, and I've also been um, heavily involved in the health humanities um, field and um, was a co-founder of the, uh, the new Canadian Association of Health Humanities. So. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit, I want to start a little bit by talking about health humanities in general. Uh, narrative medicine is part of health humanities and the health humanities basically its purpose is to provide some balance to the science. Uh, medicine is both an art and a science, so that's the idea of it. Um, this is what uh, Jock Murray has to say. Jock is the founder of the Housies uh, Medical Humanities Program. It was the first in Canada, founded in 1992. So he's talking about how you need both science um, and humanities. Health humanities includes an, um, basically close reading or observation plus artistic expression in one form or another. It could be graphic medicine, which is the you know, comics. Um, writing, poetry, video, illustration, visual arts, poetry, I've seen fabric arts, all sorts of things. And Health Humanities is now taught in all 17 medical schools in Canada, so it's been recognized as it's important, um, an important thing. And CanMed has recognized it as well, uh, specifically that reflective writing helps students engage in aspects outside of clinical knowledge, so outside the science. And these are aspects such as being a good communicator, and advocate, engaging with patients, that sort of thing. So interest in the health humanities um, is definitely building. As I mentioned, there's the new Canadian Association of Health Humanities, uh, which was founded um, uh, two years ago now, and uh, which is great. So um, I wanted to uh, talk now about narrative medicine. So narrative medicine is a form of clinical practice that's informed by close reading and reflective writing and storytelling. So let's start with the first part of that, the close reading. Close reading, do you remember comprehension in school it was one of our subjects or it was when I went to school? That's what close reading is. It's basically reading a text really carefully and parsing out um, in the interpretation of it. Um, a lot has been written on close reading, and I'll leave you to discover that. Um, a really good book that I found just recently, actually, is by Francine Prose called Reading Like a Writer, and um, that will be in your resource pack, which is in the Google Doc. So you'll see a whole bunch of resources uh, listed at the start of that, uh, of that document, and that's what it is. Um, so. Uh, Close reading involves also choosing um, choosing things that are going to be relevant to you, so that you know you can sustain your interest. In the selected uh, resources, I've included a short list of um, medical type readings, um, and you might want to start with Osler, who's a McGill guy, so that's dear to all our hearts. Um, so moving on to uh, reflective writing, reflective writing is a counterbalance to evidence based practice. It allows you to reflect on the work that you do and like most people, doctors want to find and sustain meaning in their occupation. Diagnosis basically abbreviates an illness experience to make it manageable. It takes up all the affect. It's an anti-narrative act. Um, narratives, like the ones we're going to engage, like written reflections, um, insist on meaning. Um, I know that there's a number of you here today who maybe are, don't do a lot of clinical work, and I just want to say that uh, reflective writing um, is also really good for in your personal life to help you deal with um, big life events or small ones and uh, to make sense of things, to relieve anxiety, all that sort of thing. Um, and I was talking to uh, Sam yesterday about how narratives might be applied to science and even to research for parsing out the understory, the story behind the affective side of science, because there is an emotional side, there's no question about that. So reflection, um, 
we're talking about reflective writing today, so we'll start with the, looking at what reflection is. Reflection is a broad term for intellectually and emotionally exploring an experience and extracting the learning offered by it to arrive at a new understanding and appreciation. Um, reflective writing in, can be done through journaling, like write, just writing in a journal, and it's very unstructured, very casual. It can be through assembled portfolios, which is a more structured thing, um, where you gather together a whole series of reflections and maybe form them into a longer work or a bigger work, or through parallel charts, um, which is the compiling of personal thoughts alongside the official chart and completing in-depth critical incident reports. Um, so a common point of entry into story for most physicians is a patient encounter that's fraught with risk, ethical complexity, interpersonal conflict, or ambiguity. Another is a case where you, find, where you missed something or made a mistake. You can find these situations in a lab as well and uh, certainly can write about them. These situations are the ones that force you to rethink familiar ways of reacting and to step outside the comfort of your evidence-based routines. You may read more or systematically research the problem. You consult a colleague, you likely do discuss what's worked in the past. And these are active, intellectual, learning-driven components of reflection, and they're essential, and they're great for helping to understand and reflect. But true reflection, also includes the affective component. This means examining your personal attitudes, beliefs, and values, and paying attention to the inevitable emotional responses to your work as you bear witness to the suffering of your patients or your colleagues, I suppose, in the lab. These might be feelings of fear, um, dread, regret, uncertainty, surprise, gratitude, even joy. All these things are part of doctoring. Narrative and reflection don't make you think or feel a particular thing. A toaster makes bread into toast. But reflective writing doesn't quite work that way. It's not instrumental. Instead, it allows people to understand others and themselves better. It um, enables people to change within themselves. Um, so I just wanted to, since you, uh, you guys are scientists, I want to tell you that there has been research on the on reflective writing. Uh, studies have shown that the capacity, to, the capacity to reflect on your work for physicians may decrease over time. And the unique, unpredictable, subjective experience of doctor and patient may be left unaddressed to the detriment of both as patients feel that they are unheard and doctors lose some satisfaction in their vocation and feel burnt out. Reflective writing holds many, many possible benefits. Um, it can increase your capacity to reflect on your work as a doctor and it can be taught, learned and nurtured so that it survives as an integral part of your work. Reflective writing about specific clinical event incidents honors the subjective experience of both the doctor and the patient, something that is normally missing in a chart or in the diagnosis. Reflective capacity is recommended for developing critical thinking skills, for informing clinical reasoning, and enhancing professionalism. It's a form of metacognition where experiences are transformed through meaning to create new insights, knowledge, and practices. Reflective writing is a vital ingredient for maintaining competence, professionalism, and empathy towards patients and colleagues. And research has shown that writing personal stories is good for both your mental and physical health. Um, expressing your true feelings has been shown to reduce stress, increase immune function, improve grades, there you go, reduce fears, and help with letting go of difficult experiences or to process powerful feelings, regrets, and errors in a clinical situation or when you're facing an illness yourself or I would say any sort of big life change. It can also help um, build resilience or the ability to bounce back, clear the mind, improve the memory, and as a way of dealing with ambiguity, clinical uncertainty, something that I've been told physicians aren't so good at. So. 
And importantly, it has demonstrated the potential to foster empathy and improve patient care. So rediscovering and writing personal narratives about why you chose a healing profession can be invigorating and bring a renewed sense of purpose and pleasures, pleasure. Stories heal us as well as our patients by helping avoid burnout. I highly recommend you'll see at the bottom of this reference um, it's Alan Peterkin's portfolio to go, and uh, it's um, the introduction of it contains a lot more information on what I'm just talking about now. If 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 that's an area that interests you, the theory behind reflective writing, um, so that's that's a good place to start. Um, but I would like to now talk about writing, which I think is why you're all here. So here we go. So seven notes about writing. Number one, there's no secret. Sorry, there is no secret and there is no formula. All you can do is to read, write, and rewrite. Read the good stuff, and I, there's some good stuff listed in your uh, resources there. Get the cadence, the, the rhythm, the, the, what it sounds like. Get it into your head. Try to copy the style of writers you admire. Um, that can be a really fun exercise. I've done that often myself. Write. You have to write every day. Um, you have to get a routine in your head. I used, to, when I was working full time, I don't work full time anymore, I, I write full time. But when I was working full time, I always made time at the beginning of my day for writing because that's when I was freshest. So I would just wake up an hour earlier, uh, go to bed an hour <laughs> earlier as well, and uh, make time for it. So set a routine for yourself, get into the habit of doing it. Um, and most importantly, rewrite which we will talk about again um, later in this session, but um, just to say that uh, Pierre Burton wrote four to five full drafts of every single book, and he's written a lot of book, books, and he says that he rewrites some paragraphs 13 to 20 times, it's a lot. I find most people don't write all that well, but they really don't realize it because no one's shown them how excesses and vagueness can creep in. To their work so we will talk about revising i'll give you some tips on on that so number two for things about writing write about the things that are important to you alistair mcleod who I'm, i hope most of you know who he is he's a wonderful canadian uh, novelist short story writer sadly he died a few years ago but he says to write about the thing you most fear which i thought was interesting so he writes about drowning and the wild sea. So you have to figure out what matters to you, maybe what you fear. Stories about clinical failures or conundrums are more honest and compelling, but they're difficult to write and lead to unsettling reflection. However, I think it's worth it because they can have a lasting impact. I sometimes get stories from doctors um, that are basically celebrating their successes. And I have to say that these rarely succeed as a work of writing. So just write instead about the things that challenge you and that are important to you. Number three, acknowledge that reflection takes time and space. This is what Virginia Woolf has to say about it. Um, basically, the, the thing is that storytellers need distance between what is lived and what is told to consider what a story actually means. Um, I find for myself that um, I, do, I do wait, but at the time of an incident or when something happens, I journal about it, I do write about it, but in a very sort of uh, discombobulated way, a way that's not really a narrative, it's just sort of little notes about things I've observed, little details that can help me write about it later to add some verisimilitude, the, the, those, those really essential details that make an event live on the page. So we need both curiosity and stillness to explore these aspects of learning, relating, and healing. That's what a reflection allows. Give reflection time to percolate, and you'll know when you're ready to write. Show, don't tell. Probably the most basic piece of advice that anyone ever gave a writer. Basically, you should relax and show us the story unfolding instead of telling us what happens. Paint a picture with words instead of providing facts in a sequence. Um, Janet Burroway, who wrote a fabulous book called Writing Fiction, and you'll see it in your list, 
gives um, gives some uh, poignant advice on this um, on this aspect. She says to deal in sensory detail. A detail is concrete if it appeals to the senses, and a detail is significant if it contains a judgment or an idea. Details you choose to include should lead the reader to come to the same conclusions as you. So they're not just random details, they're very carefully chosen. Get control of your emotion by avoiding mentioning the emotion. Instead, of, instead, describe the physical sensation experienced by the character or the physical reaction she has. Avoid filtering an image through some observing consciousness. It's more vivid if you present something directly rather than write, she saw, tell us, tell us what was there. Character is revealed through conflict. So don't tell us that Dawn is argumentative. Show him arguing. Show Simon admiring himself in a mirror. Show Rachel grimacing. These details can reveal your character as much as anything you might want to tell us. You can also show us the weather. And if it's stormy, that can match a character's stormy feelings, that sort of thing. Um, you, so you use outside devices to mirror what your characters are feeling and reinforce what you're trying to say um, to the reader. She also include dialogue. Um, it's a great, great way to access your character's thoughts. Uh, this, and, uh, and description also has a role. Describe the busy ER, which can be a reflection of the character or where the plot is going, or the quiet of a ward at midnight, the fear of making a mistake. Um, include imaginative leaps, what something reminds you of, similes, metaphors. The less straightforward the idea of winning and losing, the more morally complex is the story. You have to ask yourself, what does the character win by losing his struggle? Or what do they lose by winning? So flip the question on its head and see where that might lead you when you're trying to show instead of tell. Number five is to flesh out the story. Gail Godwin is a, a US novelist and this is what she has to say about it. Um, many, many writers struggle to find a good story that includes interesting character, conflict, and change. But you guys are lucky because medical stories have it all. The problem for physicians who want to write is not finding a good story, it's filling it out. Dr. Monica Kidd, who um, teaches at the University of Calgary, is, she's a journalist, a poet, a short story writer, novelist, um, health humanities guru. She says the problem with creative or reflective writing from medical people is that it tends to be thin. Now, by that, she means thin narratives are shallow, sort of one size fit all. They come to neat, neat conclusions and they declare a truth. Thick narratives, on the other hand, provide context, counterplots, they question authority, and they pursue truth. So rather than telling us or declaring a truth, they pursue it. And that uh, leads us quite naturally to our next point, which is to consider your audience. Um, so writing can be a valuable therapeutic tool. You can just journal, I do it all the time, and it doesn't make any difference what you say because no one else is ever gonna read it. Um, it, can, it doesn't matter how it's written either. It can have cliches, medical acronyms, whatever, whatever you want. But if you are aiming to get published and I'm hoping some of you are, you'll need to tell the story in a different way without medical jargon for one. Decide who you're writing for. Get a reader in your mind, someone who doesn't, who, someone who appreciates good writing but maybe, and narratives, but maybe doesn't know that much about medicine. Just your lay reader, and maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your aunt, whoever it is. Then try to, as you write, get rid of the jargon, keep them in mind and try to find the way that it's going to appeal to them the most, the way that it's going to resonate with them. The purpose at the end of the day is to entertain and transport your reader. So learning to be a good writer takes time and practice, and that can be difficult for the accomplished physician or the dedicated trainee. Consider Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. And when you start, go easy on yourself. 
give, your, give yourself permission to write that shitty first draft. That's what Anne Lamont calls it in her book, Bird by Bird, which is in your resources. And uh, Bird by Bird is an amazing book for starting writers. When you're starting out too, uh, give that inner critic the boot. That's the cranky critical voice that tells you you're no good. Just get rid of it, just go for it. Begin with the basics. In carpentry, you need to be able to saw wood neatly and accurately, drive nails. Later, you can bevel edges or add elegant finials. And with writing, you're practicing a craft based on certain principles. If the nails are poorly driven, your house will fall down. If the verbs are weak and your syntax rickety, your sentences will fall apart. So learn your basics. Look at that resource list. Pick a book. Find one that, um, that goes through all of the, the character, plot, dialogue, all those different components. Um, and then, I guess I have to repeat it, is to put your seat in the chair and develop yourself a routine. Because you're never going to be a good writer unless you just do it and do it and do it. Um, another thing I would say is that prompts are helpful. So um, Alan's, Alan's book again, The Portfolio to Go, is actually, um, it's got a thousand reflective writing prompts in it, so you're never gonna run out of those. Um, those are just like very simple things that um, urge you, to, that maybe will spark you to, to write. And we'll be doing more of that later on today. Another technique that I find works well is called free fall. And it was popularized by a W. O. Mitchell, a prairie writer. Basically, it's free association. You just sit down and you just write whatever. And that one thing may lead you to another, to another, to another. And you're not really telling a narrative. You're just getting stuff down. Um, and it doesn't really matter. Whether what you write matters for that minute or for all time remains to be seen. But you have to write to get there. Um, everyone has a story to tell. So you just have to learn to tell it and take a deep breath and start writing. And the process should be fun. Don't believe what you've heard about writing being so torturous. It's not as torturous as maybe some writers might want you to believe. Um, so I'll just take, uh, I'll just pause here for a minute and take uh, any questions um, that anybody might have at this point. I don't see anybody. Oh, there's somebody. You're, you're muted, I think. Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, there you go. I, just, okay, good. I wasn't okay. permitted to unmute for a second, but um, yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, I'm just curious, a lot of the resources you're mentioning, you're mentioning a resource list, but uh, maybe um, Sam might have more information on that oh, later. Do we have yeah. access to that yet? You do. It's in the Google Doc. So when you go to the Google Doc in the second half of this uh, session, you'll see the resource list is front and center. It's the first thing you'll see. So just copy and paste it into, into your own documents or, or keep the link to the Google Doc or whatever okay. you want to do. So that, yeah, they're all, they're all listed there. Yeah. Is yeah. That's my fault. Um, I told Barbara it would be in there. There's two docs. I'll put it in the same one. The, oh, the resources okay. she's referring, uh, Barbara's referring to is actually in the resources list in the conference guide. Oh, sorry, the, sorry, Sam. It's okay. The writing and reflection workshop document, the working document, doesn't have it right now, but I'll put it a link to it at the top. That's okay. what she's referring. That's my mistake. Okay. Sorry. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, anybody else? Matt, did you have something? I can see you. <laughs> okay. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I just wanted to... Um, um, spend, a, spend a minute um, talking about the issue of consent. Uh, so as physician writers, um, you're different from the rest of us. I can write about my friends in nonfiction, even if I want. It's my story. I can write whatever I want, basically, unless I libel somebody. You may choose to write, and most, most, most often for yourself, which is fine. But if you're choosing to write or to, to, for something that might be published in a literary or a professional journal or even in a blog, even online, um, publishing for you would most often involve the ethical consideration of consent. So clinicians have an obligation. If your article includes a patient encounter, a patient story, or depicts a colleague, 
you need to get consent from them for two reasons. First of all, the story occurred in a confidential clinical situation. You are not free to tell a patient's story, not even to your spouse, much less to publish it. And as healthcare professionals, you ask for patient permission to do diagnostic tests, surgery, consults, to invite students in. So why would you feel free to publish their stories? The second reason these stories aren't yours to tell is because telling contradicts the Hippocratic Oath. To do no harm, keep secret, that sort of thing. One must consider, sorry, the fact of the matter is, is that your stories can do harm. One must consider, indeed, the demonstrated harm these stories may inflict on a patient or protagonist. So Dr. R.J. Stoller in the States recounted uh, the response of a patient who spotted herself in a vignette in a journal article, and she was really taken aback by it. It really was a trauma to her. So there is that potential to do harm. Um, so we do just, just, to, just to be careful about the consent issue. Um, so some writers justify telling these stories. They tell me that they've anonymized their patient characters, changed their age, name, geographic location, whatever. But often it's their affiliation, the byline, that will allow patients to be recognizable to themselves, their families, and those working at the institution. The litmus test that we use at uh, CMAJ is to ask whether we think the patient could self-identify or whether those who knew him or her could pick him or her out of your narrative. And uh, if the answer is right, then you have to get consent. We have a form on our cmaj.ca under the authors tab. Um, we can, you can find that. Um, getting consent may sound daunting, but actually most, a lot of patients are very receptive to it. They feel honored that their story is being shared and they hope it might help others. Many want their name changed and, and that's fine. Um, so, so we can do that. Anyway, so just a little caveat about that. Um, I'd like to, uh, to uh, talk a little bit now about um, what I call creative revision, which I mentioned to you earlier. And it, to me, is the heart of writing. And uh, Roald Dahl agrees with me. As an editor, I find that writers often don't revise enough. So as I said, give yourself permission to write that shitty first draft. Don't belabor it. Just get it down. But the second and the subsequent drafts have a different aim. They have to create an incident-based story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have to be paced so that the reader wants to know what's going to happen next. Um, it's easier than writing the first draft in some way because the first draft is just that scary blank page. Now you actually have something to work with. You have clay and it's up to you to mold it. I call this creative revising. Revising is not proofreading. You do have to do that. You have to check spelling, verb tenses, and all of that. But Creative revising is not the same. Um, proofreading is not a substitute for serious, substantive manuscript revision. Revisions almost always involve reimagining a piece. This allows you to engage your creative voice. You revise on three levels, or for three things rather. For story, that's the long view. For sentence, that's the specific nitty gritty. And for detail, which is even more nitty gritty, and to make sure it's actually correct. So I'd like to uh, present five ideas about creative revising. I developed a mnemonic called draft. So D is deconstruct for better construction. This is about the story structure. Is the piece arranged logically and does it hold together? As a storyteller, you have to keep your reader's attention and build the tension. Have you told the story as best you can? The scenes are defined by change in time, setting or character. And this is important because when it comes to deconstructing, that's how you take a piece, a story apart. You look for a change of scene, um, setting or character, and those are what, I, what Douglas Glover calls blobs. Uh, Douglas Glover is a Canadian, well, he was a mistake, but he's a Canadian writer, very good guy. So you take these globs, these succinct parts, and you can shift them all around. I, I sometimes even take my story and cut it up and put it 
print it out, cut it up, put it on, a, on, the, on the floor and rearrange my blobs um, to uh, find a better way to tell my story, a way that will build the tension and um, get rid of a lot of the backstory and tighten and focus. So Dinty Moore, who's also in your list there, offers some great advice about structure. He says the opening impulse and the ending should be connected, either by a direct line of action or reaction running through the entire story or a current of emotion. So end and beginning, and there has to be some progression. Something has to happen. You can't have a guy, you know, waking up for a dream in the first scene and waking up from the dream in the last scene. There has to be some progression in between. There are no steadfast rules, however, I will say that, except that if the beginning and ending don't feel coupled in this way, you may have to rethink your plot and the way you're structuring things. So the second uh, letter is R for reader, and I mean this in two sentences. Consider your reader, if you're aiming to publish, keep them motivated to read and make the story compelling and interesting. Tell your story as though you're trying to keep people awake. In short, just tell a damn good story. The second reader is to find somebody who can read it, a critical reader, not a friend or a relative or someone who's just gonna tell you that it's great. You want someone who is well-read and passionate about literature, who will be honest with you. Tell, you have to set a few ground rules, which we'll go over when we're doing critiquing, but basically they should be kind and specific and avoid platitudes. <laughs> So A is for read it aloud, aloud. Call on your ears experience with language and pay attention to how things stand, how things sound, the music of the language. Um, tape yourself to grasp that rhythm. When you're reading, if you stumble over something, put a little tick mark beside it and you, then you'll know that it has to be changed. Um, it's, this is a great way to get dialogue right. People have problems with dialogue. But if it sounds right, if it sounds the way people are going to speak, then, you'll pro then you probably do have it right. Um, the ear is often more helpful than the brain in recognizing simple awkwardnesses or redundant sentences that may sound good, but maybe don't mean anything, which brings us to the fat. So cut it out, cut the fat. Mavis Gallant, a uh, famous short story writer, likens writing and editing to sculpting. She says, you remove, you eliminate in order to make the work visible. So you remove and eliminate to make the work visible. And even those pages that you remove, somehow they remain in the whole. They've informed the whole. But you have to be careful because if you remove too much, you could destroy the work. This is a sculptor could destroy the sculpture. Your goal is to achieve a more powerful whole. And all of those parts are dependent on one another and necessary for the desired effect. So just to uh, drill down a little bit, in terms of language and um, maybe fatty words, <laughs> it's best to always use strong, active, and specific verbs versus adverbs to carry the main meaning. In other words, to replace, she walked slowly with, she meandered, she strolled, she wandered, she drifted, each of which brings a slightly different meaning and a more specific meaning to she walks slowly. Um, another uh, place uh, to get rid of the fat is to get rid of the passive voice. Instead of saying there were two men stumbling down the street, say two men stumbled down the street. So make it direct. It engages the reader a lot more. Avoid the verb to be. For example, instead of saying she was telling a story, say she told a story. It's more direct. The most common and obvious errors in my experience involve weasel, weasel words, <laughs> which these words are often just not necessary just is one of them actually. And Carol Shields told me to stop using just in my writing and I did and it was amazing. So there's other words that you should watch um, that they're not overused. You'll find lists of these in some of the books. Uh, words like that, it's, about, actually, almost, already, even, exactly, finally, 
here, kind of, nearly, you get the point. Also watch for too many adverbs and adjectives, like just loading, just pick the one that works the best. That's, keep it simple. Lose the cliches um, and the belabored metaphors or similes. Um, I mean, if they really sing, that's great, but uh, when in doubt, cut it out. This can be a difficult process. I make it sound like it's easy, but it's difficult because we do become emotionally involved with our writing. And what I'm asking you to do actually a lot of the times is to kill your darlings, things that you love the most. Um, they don't work in the story. You have to get rid of them. What I do is I keep a darlings file and the things that I cut out that I really like, I put them in my file and I may use them again. But I may use them for the first time actually in another story or I may never use them. But the fact of the matter is just keeping them makes me feel better. So that's what I do. I also keep multiple graphs of a story. I just number them one, two, three, um, just in case I decide at some point that a previous version was actually better or it contained something that I wanted. So that's it for fat T. Toss the last paragraph. This was advice given to Irwin Shaw by his editors at the New Yorker, and it's something that I do all the time at CMIJ. I would say 90% of the narratives that I edit, I recommend cutting the last paragraph. The reason for that is that that's the one where you tell us what the story is about. You provide a sort of tidy ending. Um, if you cut it out, you'll almost invariably be left with a much better story and readers will like it much better too. Readers want to be shaken, they want to figure it out, to ponder the meaning. Allow them to pursue the truth, that's the reward in reading narratives, so don't deprive them. The take home message should be inherent in the story, and if it's not, you better look at the story again. I think we write these paragraphs because that's the form of the essay. You tell us what you're going to say, you say it, and then you tell us what you told us. But narratives aren't essays. There's something different. They're storytelling. So um, if, you're, if you're rigorous about revision, um, I would say you'll greatly improve your chance of publication. So I'll just um, pause here. This is the end of the sort of formal presentation that I was going to give today, and we're going to uh, take a little break but first of all I'd just like to ask if there are any any questions at this point happy to chat okay all right let's um I was going to take a just a um a five minute bio break just to give people we, a chance oh just sorry, we do have some yeah. questions I think I've oh okay stopped. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I had a question, but I couldn't unmute myself. Um, okay. So I was sort of just getting my bearings at the beginning. Uh, so I apologize if I missed this, but uh, you mentioned early on about some uh, some courses in creative writing and expressive writing that were given to medical doctors. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more, like what they look like. Are they standard for, is this something that's common or is it more of an experimental program where you happen to be um, working or what? Um, I think they're becoming increasingly common. Sometimes, in some medical schools, the humanities are um, part of the core curriculum. People, have the doctors, uh, trainees have to take them. But in other schools, they aren't. They're uh, an optional thing. For example, I, the one I know best is at University of Toronto, and they offer um, various programs and things through the year. There's a couple of uh, resident uh, critiquing groups that, that uh, meet regularly that are affiliated with the University of Toronto, and they read work they invite guests in like myself to talk about writing and that sort of thing um, U of T also offers uh, courses specifically in narrative there's um, they run what's called a narrative atelier it runs every second year and it's a uh, I think it's runs four days and it's an intensive uh, reflective writing workshop so those sorts of things are available I'm sure McGill has offerings as well um, you could ask uh, or any of the other uh, medical in, in Quebec, uh, you could just ask um, ask your people at the um, at the department level what they offer in terms of uh, health humanities and and see what see what they can give you. Um, you could also get in touch with the people at University of Toronto and maybe uh, connect with one of the residents that's offering the, uh, the critiquing 
um, um, groups and uh, maybe you know learn what they're doing and, uh, and, and then start your own group at, at your institution. They're very popular, those critiquing groups. There, there was just one for a long time. I've spoken twice there and now they've just formed an, another, another group. So uh, it's excellent because you want to keep them kind of small. They're sort of intimate things. You really don't want more than 10 people or so. So now they have two, which is great. Uh, um, what, what kind of skills are they teaching or what is the purpose, I suppose? So, um, I mean, I think you might have referred to this earlier in your talk, but I'm, I'm familiar more with the treatment side or the, the patient centered side of writing. So uh, you might have referred to the work of James Pennebaker, who showed that expressive writing, um, it can actually have physiological effects on people's yes. health. Like, um, yeah. And but so when doctors are taking these courses, are they are they learning these skills <clears throat> to improve their own practice or as something that they might offer their patients to uh, to help them? Or is it? Yeah, I'm just trying to get a better okay, sense. Of what I, the uh, is like. Yeah, there there is there is research. And I did I did touch on that, although I didn't reference any of it. Um, but um, there's quite a bit bit of it um, in this book here, The Portfolio to Go by Alan Peterkin and in other resources mm -hmm. that I've listed. Um, Basically, the purpose, I guess, of reflective writing is twofold. It's to help you as a physician to deal with um, the situations um, that are bothering you that, um, and to expand your, your perception of practice, to bring the affective component back into your practice so that you have a broader and better understanding of what you're doing. Um, and it also, I think, is helpful um, to the patient um, because uh, it allows you to have more empathy toward them. And um, if they're reading these stories, it sometimes can be helpful to them. I've had patients read some of the stories in CMAJ and send me notes about how grateful they were to see that someone had a similar experience and that, you know, that they understood their experience better now having read this story. So yeah, I think there are many, many benefits. And as you mentioned, physiologically, this is physiological benefits, psychological benefits for sure. Um, but it's the, um, Preventing burnout, enriching your professionalism and your practice, I think, for you. Was there any other question? Did anybody else have a question? I had uh, some questions. It was just, uh, I thought it's quite interesting when you talk about the words that we should stop using. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's funny you said the stop using just and I find myself whenever I'm writing an email, I always have to go back and get rid of all the justs that I've put in. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering what, what are these words and why do we put them and why should we get rid of all the well, words you listed? Like yeah. what's the difference between the good words and the bad words? I think, it, I think the main difference is that a lot of the, the weasel words, as I call them, are qualifiers. Um, so if you take them out, you're writing your, what you're saying, your communication becomes more emphatic. It becomes less uncertain. It becomes, um, uh, more to the point, shorter, succinct, and, uh, you know, just communicates just, there I am, communicates in a more effective manner. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned some of them. I'll, I'll give you a few more, uh, weasel, weasel words even, exactly, finally, here, kind of, nearly, now, really, seems, somehow, somewhat, sort of, suddenly, then, there, and truly. And I mean, there's, a, there's probably a lot more than that. That's just a list that I, you know, pulled together. Those are sort of my pet peeve ones. But uh, thanks for asking that, Sam. And thanks for your question too, Matt. Um, no Tariq, did you have a question? Well, I was kind of going to touch on that a little bit and wonder what you thought about um, some other weaselly things about writing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I definitely, um, I see the benefit in what you're saying, really interesting. And it also makes me think of things like, um, narratively speaking, whether or not it's important to cut things out, like saying, like in the morning when she woke up, you know what I mean? Obviously she woke up in the morning, but I mean, that's yeah. just what naturally would happen. So I wonder... Have you seen any things narratively, um, that, like any things commonly that are being told as part of a narrative that you think should just be eliminated? Sure, I think um, that example that you gave, that's a, a very common one. It's always, um, if you can, begin in the middle of the action. She woke, the birds were singing. 
rather than in the morning she woke up, you know, she woke, the birds were singing, the sun was, you know, the sun was in her eyes, whatever, whatever it was, find a different way of telling that, that um, is more immediate and gets us into the character right away. So anyway, that's, that's the sort of thing. So just the, the important thing is to begin in the middle of the action. Right. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I have one last know. question. If, oh, if sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, it, 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 I, so I'm in the, a, more of a scientist than a clinician, and I imagine that's probably the case for yeah. most people at this conference because we're more yes. in research. Um, so I'm wondering if you, how would you uh, sell the idea of becoming good at expressive writing um, as being valuable to someone who's more on the research side? Because I, I, mm -hmm. it occurs to me that a lot of scientists I know tend not to be well-rounded, which is unfortunate, but also kind of unavoidable given all the work we have to do in the lab, right? It doesn't sure, always leave sure. enough time left over, but how would you sell yeah. that skill set so, to people who don't otherwise really need it in their life? Yeah, um, I think it can really help you personally in your relationships with other people, in um, having a, an ability to express yourself is always a good thing. Um, writing in this way, reflective writing can, I'm, I'm not a clinician either. I find reflective writing is extremely useful in processing my feelings about something. If I'm frustrated, if I'm angry, you know, whatever it is, by writing about it and parsing out the emotion and you know maybe making a little story about it, I can figure it out in a much better way. So I think it can be helpful to you um, personally um, in sorting out your own emotions. It might help you in your interpersonal relationships as well because it does engender empathy, which is an important thing to have when you want to have relationships with people. Um, I think it's. Um, I think it's a disservice to scientists that that the affective part hasn't been as well developed. I mean, I understand why. I understand that you you know you have so much to learn, and and but it shouldn't be at the exclusion of this other part. Um, as the, it's the art and the science of medicine, it's also the art and the science of your life, and so. If you welcome that into your life and start doing some of this reflective writing, I think I think you will find it beneficial to yourself. Great, thanks. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Um, I think we're running a little short of time. I have eleven fifty-seven already here, and uh, which is almost noon, and I think we're supposed to end this shindig at uh, twelve thirty. So I'm going to pass on the bio break. Sorry about that. If you uh, do need such a thing, by all means. Just duck out and do whatever that is necessary. I'm going to move right now to the writing component of this workshop. So just to tell you that um, this is a confidential session and it will not be recorded. 